This is Dimitri Lascaris reporting for the Real News Network from Athens, Greece. We've come back uh, to Athens uh, this month, October 2017, as part of our ongoing coverage of the economic and political crisis in Greece that erupted in 2010. We began that coverage in January of 2015 with the election, uh, the first election of the Syriza government led by Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras. Uh, we returned in July uh, of that year to cover the referendum, the historic referendum on austerity. We came back last year in the summer to cover the uh, refugee crisis in Lesbos, Greece. And we're here this year to try to examine whether or not Greece has finally begun to emerge from this political and economic crisis. Yesterday, we started our coverage by interviewing some people on the street by the Athens uh, Polytechnic Institute about how uh, austerity policies and the political uh, conditions have affected them and whether they feel there's been an improvement in their lives. Today, we've come to the University of Athens Law School and we're here today with uh, Professor uh, Michael Spurdalakis. And Michael uh, is a professor of political sociology and the dean of the School of Economics and Politics at the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens. He's also a member of the executive of the Nikos Poulantzas Institute and of the collective of the Social Register. And uh, he's also the chair of the hearing committee for revision of the Greek constitution. And thank you so much for joining us again, Michael. Good to have you back. <laughs> thank you. So uh, next month, is the 44th anniversary of the massive uprising at the Athens Polytechnic, which occurred in November of 1973. It was against a US-backed military junta led by a Greek army colonel, uh, George Papadopoulos, uh, who had been remarkably a Nazi collaborator during the Second World War. And months earlier, uh, before that uprising in November, uh, in February 1973, an important protest took, here, uh, took place here at the University of Athens Law School. And, I was and in you... this building, this is a historical building, right. which uh, we, you know, students, some of us were there. We occupied this building and this was the first uh, anti-junta, anti-dictatorship movement of the students that led to the great operation of the Polytechnic School months la later. And I, and I learned uh, just before we began our interview today that you were there, you were at the Polytechnic. And could you tell In us both events? Yeah. Could, could you tell us just generally what you saw, what you witnessed and how uh, the role that you feel that that played in the demise of this junta? It contributed to the demise. There's no uh, doubt it was uh, a more or less spontaneous uh, event of, uh, of, uh, this, of the students. It was eventually coordinated by a number of uh, uh, students who were organizing very small anti-dictatorship uh, groups and the rest of us who happen to be a little younger uh, follow. Uh, but uh, there is a dimension of this three-day event which is, uh, which is often forgotten. Uh, for example, the Communist Party in the beginning was very hesitant because it it was a spontaneous, as I said, initially kind of event, and they didn't know what, what was going on, so they were a bit uh, skeptical about the event. And this other dimension, which is even more important, uh, it's uh, that the, the things got off hand for the, 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 the regime when workers and peasants from the nearby areas join the, the, the revolt. And at that time, I guess, the junta decided to uh, crush the uprising and send the tanks. And we had, uh, you know, several people got uh, killed and uh, a lot more um, went, end up in prison, uh, etc. But that was uh, a catalyst at the beginning of the, the demise of, of, uh, of the junta, uh, but it wasn't the reason for the fall of the, of the junta, one must, uh, must, uh, must say. And, and uh, I understand that a, a law came out of, I mean, probably there were many legislative initi initiatives emerging from the demise of the junta, but one of them, I understand, was a law pertaining to police presence on the campus of the Polytechnic Institute. And is it is still the case today that the police are barred from entering the campus? Of, uh... This is, uh, this is uh, we call it the asylum uh, on the basis of academic f uh, freedom. And in fact, it's something that even the German, Germans during the Nazis, when they occupied the city, they didn't uh, violate that unwritten law of asylum. Uh, 
uh, in uh, in uh, the Greek uh, in the in the Greek uh, university campuses. Um, the right wing uh, a few years back or uh, the old regime before Caesar, they try to undermine this unwritten uh, law, uh, focusing primarily on some uh, exaggeration of the use of, of that of privilege that every university should enjoy. Uh, but uh, Syriza government, according to the latest law, educational law, re-establish the legally the that uh, that uh, privilege to 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 the universities. Right. Well, we're we're kind of at a fortuitous moment for for us to have this discussion because Prime Minister Tsipras was in Washington yesterday, uh, and I I believe this is the first time that he's actually met with President Trump. Yeah. Uh, would that be fair? But it was the th third time in uh, two and a half years that uh, the Greek Prime Minister uh, met with a U.S. President. Right. Twice before with uh, President Obama and now. And it, it, it very interesting historical context, is, of course, is not only that uh, mm -hmm. Papadopoulos had connections to the CIA, uh, the dictator Papadopoulos, but also uh, the administration of Richard Nixon was openly supportive of Papadopoulos, and in fact, uh, Spiro Agnew, uh, who remarkably was of Greek origin, the vice president of the Nixon administration, said that Papadopoulos was, quote, the best thing to happen to Greece since Pericles ruled in ancient Athens. <laughs> this was a leader who, uh, a dictator, a dictator who, uh, who yeah. presided over torture, yeah. the disappearance. I, of remember, uh, I remember his ridiculous, in fact, uh, visit to Greece when I was a high school student so who we were forced by our teachers to stand on the line and uh, pretend that we are the favor crowds welcoming the vice president of the United States back in the 70s. But that's okay, it's, it's history and it's behind us and it's, you know, it's kind of a, a stepping stone so, towards a, a more solid and more uh, genuine demo, uh, democratic rule in this country. Right. I was struck, however, by uh, the Prime Minister's remarks after his meeting with Mr. Trump, and I want to preface this, but I want to be fair to Prime Minister Tsipras because I come from Canada. Our government, our country has uh, an extraordinary degree of economic interdependence with the United States, and our uh, Prime Minister, who I think has tried Prime Minister Trudeau to characterize himself as a progressive, has been, to the disappointment of many people on the left, very, very muted in his criticism of President Trump. Uh, no matter, regardless of how erratic and dangerous the president's behavior may seem. So I must be fair to Prime Minister Tsipras and acknowledge that there is this reality about how do you deal with this president of the most powerful country in the world. But he made this, this comment after uh, he met with President Trump. We have common values. Don't forget that the value of democracy and freedom was born in Greece. It's one of the values that traverses American culture and American tradition. The president now continues that tradition. Be tr you know, Candidly, do you think that this president um, can be relied upon any more than the administration of President Nixon to be a guarantor of Greek democracy? Well, listen, I mean, uh, these kind of statements are part of the uh, uh, ceremonies and uh, the, the, the rhetoric of similar ceremonies when leaders of two nations uh, meet. You always find to create a common ground even when there is not much of common ground. And it seems to me that the um, uh, uh, Prime Minister's statement had to do with that and also to trying to preface uh, his main uh, goal, it seems to me, of the visit and he has to do to promote uh, investments for this country that uh, the, the, uh, the country and the society needs them uh, very much. I uh, try to say that we were trying to improve our uh, geopolitical uh, role in this, in this region, trying to state, and they did, he did, in fact, uh, the problems with, we have with Turkey, with violation of airspace in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the country, and this might end up uh, in, a, in an accident, unfortunate accident for two allies within the NATO, NATO framework. Um, so 
uh, it said another thing that this is the best period of Greek American relationship. And in fact, it's true. If you, one knows the recent history, the president of the US uh, government interference in the Greek Civil War, uh, and later on with the junta, as you mentioned, um, uh, and uh, then the anti-American, very uh, uh, high-pitched, if you like, anti-American sentiments of the, of the Greek people, um, this, this, this is, was a, a, a fair statement to make, that now we are in a better relations, there's no much interference and all that kind of stuff. There, there is also another dimension. Uh, the role of the U.S. in the IMF uh, and uh, IMF's involvement in uh, the Troika and, uh, you know, the control of this uh, uh, country in the last few years is very important. Uh, probably the U.S., probably the U.S. can um, uh, interfere in the IMF and relax a little bit the the measures that this can uh, 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 impose of austerity imposed to this country in exchange of uh, forgiving uh, part of of our debt which is unmanageable so it's a bit more complicated and it has to do with diplomatic language it seems to me um, for those who uh, approach politics in a more sentimental way, uh, I, the reaction to this statement, it's absolutely justified and understandable, but uh, it seems to me one should take that within the, the context and it's okay. So let, let's uh, return to the question of fascism in Greece. When, when the junta fell, many hoped that we'd seen the end of the scourge of fascism in Greece, but then of course uh, a party called Golden Dawn uh, rose to some prominence within the country and uh, in the last election of September 2015, it garnered 7% of the vote approximately and uh, had the third largest number of seats in parliament, even eclipsing PASOK, which for many years, uh, the Panhellenic Socialist Movement, which for many years had governed Greece after the fall mm -hmm. of the junta. Um, and this happened, the 7% was achieved and these seats were won, despite the fact that the leadership of Golden Dawn was in jail at the time, much of the leadership. Uh, why was the leadership of Golden Dawn in jail? And broadly speaking, what has transpired since the September uh, 2015 election in terms of uh, prosecutions of leaders of the, of the movement, of the party? The rise of Golden Dawn, I mean, after the fall of Junta, of course, there were several groupings who were uh, uh, part of the radical right, of neo-Nazis, etc., you know, pro-Junta groupings, you can understand you know, remnants of the Civil War, remnants of the uh, peculiar uh, uh, application of the rules of, of law after the Civil War, the Junta, etc. So there were some, and, but at the fringes of, of mainstream uh, politics, uh, some of them found their way into the mainstream uh, uh, political uh, parties, but that was there. Um, the crisis and the fact that another radical right nationalist group was legitimized by the coalition governments formed after the crisis. And would, would this have been Laos? It was La Laos, mm -hmm. you know. They, they, so mainstream political parties accepted this, uh, if you like, uh, uh, forerunners of the Golden Dawn into the government, legitimized this kind of, um, uh, and indirectly, of course, they promoted the, uh, the rise of uh, Golden, uh, uh, Golden Dawn. Uh, Golden Dawn, is uh, an organization, it's a typical militia organization in, uh, in a typical neo-Nazi kind of organization. It's uh, verified by its rhetoric and, and its, its, its organization. 
Uh, the trial uh, had to do with three main, which is, has been going on for over a year and a half now, um, has been, uh, it has to do with three uh, criminal cases. The killing of the, uh, of the rap singer, Pablos Fisas, the attack to the... He's, a, he's an anti-fascist rap singer. He was an anti-fascist uh, rap by a, a militia group in uh, the working class neighborhoods in, uh, in, 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 uh, of Athens. Um, the, the attack of uh, trade unionists in, uh, in uh, the area where the shipyards are and another working class or nearby near working class area. And the attack of uh, Egyptian fishermen that left a lot of people injured or handicapped even, etc. Um, it took a lot of uh, time and energy for the public prosecution to take, to take uh, place. Uh, eventually, uh, the interrogation started. Uh, the Greek system takes a long time. It is not as quick as in other countries as we know in, in Canada or in, uh, in the U.S. And eventually the trial uh, is going on for, as I said, a year and a half. The witnesses for, um, for the side of the public prosecutors are almost 150. They had to be interrogated and all that. I was one of them, in fact. Uh, so about a, a, a month ago, I was, right. or less. Can you give us the essence of your testimony at the trial? Well, in my essence, uh, I was called by the public prosecutors uh, in the pre preliminary procedures uh, to testify about these organizations. And I, and I said uh, basically three things, that their rhetoric is uh, outside the boundaries of the Greek constitution of uh, uh, civil rights, uh, uh, international declarations that our constitution and democratic constitutions uh, inspire to because it's rhetoric, it's hatred against minorities, etc. But that's not, that's, that's not the only thing. The thing is that this is followed and supported by militia organization, leaders of this militia is the leadership of, of, uh, of Golden Dawn and the leader of uh, particular of Michal Oliakos, the inferior if you like. Mm -hmm. And the third point I made is that at the time I was testifying, which was three years ago in fact, um, it's, uh, uh, they were opening offices, they had a, a weekly newspaper, uh, they organized several events and uh, if from a uh, research point of view, if you like, one has to see where their funds come from. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, is, so this is what I suggested and I was testified for about six uh, hours. Of course, the uh, defense lawyers for, uh, you know, uh, defense of, uh, they asked me that I to delegitimize me uh, and other witnesses, of course, uh, saying that I'm uh, uh, all sorts of things, that I, ring, I read the no wrong newspapers uh, or, uh, mm, or number that I'm on, I'm on the left, uh, that uh, kind of, that, that kind of thing. And uh, they didn't understand why uh, I, I was called to witness when at the same time I don't have any first-hand knowledge of the three cases. In, uh, in of, essence, you were treated as an expert witness by the prosecution. Ex exactly. Right. That, this is uh, what, uh, what I said. But uh, it seems to me that this trial is going to go for a long time. There are two or three maybe sessions every week. Mm -hmm. uh, the documents are thousands and thousands of pages, etc. So it's going to take another, another year. The important thing and the interesting thing is that the media seems to be more or less indifferent about the trial. Mm -hmm. The media, uh, you know, yes, there is a trial taken, uh, but they don't 
they don't report mm -hmm. uh, very much, with the exception of some um, uh, um, journalists and uh, some uh, newspaper, one maybe, one or two newspapers which are uh, left center kind of newspapers and they, uh, they are more objective kind of uh, press. If the prosecution succeeds, what would happen to Golden Dawn? Would it become abolished? Would its leaders be uh, pro convicted to lengthy jail terms potentially? What would you expect? Maybe, to maybe that, and uh, then we'll see what, uh, uh, what happens. Because they are prosecuted not politically, but for criminal actions. Mm -hmm. So they might end up being in, in prison with uh, uh, heavy uh, with heavy sentences that they have to deal, and I don't know what what is uh, what is going to uh, happen. Speaking of this uh, section of ideas and politics of the Greek spectrum, it seems to me that the Golden Dawn, with their nationalist, racist, and similar kind of ideas, they push the rhetoric of the opposition to the right. Okay, um, the the promoting rule of law. I mean, um, not rule of law. Authoritarianism. The, 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 you know. Yeah. They they uh, promote they uh, promote anti-refugee, anti-immigrant kind of uh, rhetoric. They, uh, they they want to restrict. Uh, freedoms of action and freedoms of freedom of speech especially of of the of the left they want uh, to suppress um, uh, gay rights etc and the, so all this it's uh, uh, somehow forces the uh, the uh, the opposition parties to 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 the right so, uh, they, uh, to some extent, they are like catalysts to uh, uh, become more, uh, a more authoritarian, individualistic, and more, at the same time, nationalist and authoritarian uh, 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 running of public affairs. And, uh, so, I want to talk to you about sort of attitudes within the police towards Golden Dawn. There was an okay. An analysis that was done uh, a few years ago, I understand, of uh, polling stations and results in the election. Yes. And uh, the analysis seemed to suggest that a majority, in excess of 50% of the Greek police, were sympathetic to Golden Dawn. Mm -hmm. uh, a few weeks ago, uh, approximately 3,000 protesters, anti-fascist protesters, took to the streets of Athens and demanded uh, that they be held accountable, the murderers of Pavlos Fisas and other Yes. Uh, com the committers of other crimes of a right because the nature. anniversary of his uh, assassination. Right, and some of them broke away. I understand from the main protest, and where there were clashes with police, and they were shouting "Crush the Nazis!" And you know, given the reality or the apparent reality of sympathy within the the law enforcement community towards Golden Dawn, do you think that the Greek public can they can rely upon they can trust the law enforcement authorities to bring to justice? the killers of uh, Pavlos Fisas and, the, and the, I, those who masterminded all of this? I know that the, the, the minister responsible for the police and the law enforcing and the minister of justice are doing their best to control what they inherited. When, as you said, it might not be 50% plus. In some cases, yes, they were, but, you know, even 30% of your force, it's influenced by this kind of ideas, you, it, it takes some time and you have to do. So I know that they are doing their best to put this under control and to clean the law enforcing community, as you said, from this kind of ideas, individuals and the powers. Mm -hmm. um, now, the clashes with the police you mentioned, uh, first of all, we see less aggression from the part of the police. The clashes you mentioned for the anniversary of this uh, came from the Black Bloc who attacked the 
the, the police and the police um, uh, responded to that the way that almost every, any police would, would have done. This is not uh, a good thing about, about democracy and is no, it's not a good thing about the way that the, we, we control democratically and according to the rules of law, this, this law enforcing community. However, uh, I know that the government is doing their best. Um, uh, they're renewing the leadership, their, their, their educational programs, and there is uh, the introduction of new laws that they control this. And the most aggressive section of the police was abolished. Um, so there are things that they have done, but we are not uh, where you and I would like to see yet. Um, there is a little more um, 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 amendment towards acceptance of the law enforcing community, but there's still a lot of anger and a lot of uh, friction and hatred among the law enforcing community and the people who protest, uh, you know, that, uh, that kind of thing. Well, I'd like to uh, move on to a different subject uh, in part two of our interview. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to discuss with you a little bit efforts of the, the CDZ government to rein in the oligarchy and particularly its dominance within the media. Uh, so uh, I hope uh, we can- It's connected, it's connected. As I said, there were a lot of these things the, the, the media is trying to uh, blow out of proportions the, the protest and the powers of the police or the violation of the police and all that yeah. kind of stuff through the media right. or uh, to so silence the, 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 the issue with the, the actions of uh, Golden Dawn, et, et cetera. So yeah. it is connected, uh, Dimitri. So, so let's, uh, what we're going to talk about that in part two, and this has been Dimitri Lascaris uh, for The Real News from the University of Athens in Athens, Greece. Mm -hmm.